Good day, this is Frontline News. I'm Abigail Smythe. Coming up in the newscast, a taximan killed in East Kingston. Flare-up of violence leaves one dead in August town. Omar Collimore in police custody. In the region, President of the Caribbean Development Bank predicts 2% growth for the region this year. And further overseas, Vladimir Putin's challenger in Russian elections says she believes Russian hackers meddled in U.S. presidential elections. Now for the details. A taxi man was killed along the Sir Florizel Glasspool Highway in Kingston Wednesday night. Michael Sharp tells us more. Travelling towards Harbourview from downtown Kingston had to divert onto the other side of the roadway as their police car was in the way blocking traffic. When we inquired, we found out that it was a scene of murder. What we have ascertained is that a taxi man had his throat slashed. We understand that this AD wagon traversed the journey from downtown Kingston to Harbourview. As it, to the identity of this person at this time, that is unknown. And the scene of crime is on the scene and looking for clues as to what might have led to the death of this man. Michael Sharp. Frontline News. Frontline News has learned that the deceased is 56-year-old Desmond Grant, also known as Fire of an 11 Miles Bull Bay address. A man was killed in Clarendon Wednesday afternoon. Dead is 21-year-old Dave McLean of Savannah Cross. Frontline News understands that Mr. McLean was out on bail on a murder charge. Reports are that loud explosions were heard on Paradise Street, Maypen. The police were called and upon their arrival, a wounded man was found in the middle of the road. He was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. Residents claim they did not know the deceased. And there was another flare-up of violence in August Town on Thursday. One man was killed following a shooting along August Town Road in the afternoon. Two persons were also injured. About 3.35 p.m., gunmen approach a group of persons along 91 Augustone Road, open gun fired. Four persons were shot and injured, one succumbed to his injuries at the hospital. At this time, the investigation is ongoing. The St. Andrew, the St. Andrew Central Police had to be keeping a close watch on the area. The area has been tense following a recent quadruple murder there. And Omar Collimore, the man wanted by the police in connection with the murder of his wife and a taxi driver in St. Andrew, has been apprehended by the police. Mr. Collimore was arrested at a guest house in St. Elizabeth on Wednesday. Investigators revealed that they have information that he was making plans to leave the island by boat. Mrs. Simone Campbell Collimore and taxi operator Winston Walters were shot dead about 4 p.m. on January 2 along Stanley Terrace in Red Hill, St. Andrew. According to reports, the two had just arrived at an apartment building where Collymore lived when four men traveling on two motorbikes rode up. The two gunmen reportedly got off the bikes and opened fire multiple times. Mrs. Collymore, who was reportedly shot 21 times and Walters, died on the spot. A day before her funeral, Omar Collymore, who is a United States citizen, was stopped at the Norman Manley International Airport as he was attempting to leave the island. And a man has been taken into custody in connection with the recent double murder of an elderly couple in retreat, St. Thomas. Reports are that on Tuesday, January 9, about 10.30 a.m., the bodies of 81-year-old Melbourne Flake and his wife, 70-year-old Etta, were found at their home with their hands and feet bound. The suspect was held in Seaforth District, St. Thomas, on Wednesday following investigations. He is to be questioned in the presence of his attorney. His identity is being withheld until further investigations. In the meantime, the police are also appealing to anyone who can assist them with their investigations into a triple murder which took place in Georgia District St. Thomas on Saturday, January 20 to contact the Morant Bay Criminal Investigation Branch at 982-1027, Police 119 Emergency Number 811, Crime Stop at 311 or the nearest police station. High Court Judge Bertram Morrison on Thursday adjourned the trial of St. Thomas man Michael McLean to allow the accused killer to get a new attorney. 
This will be McLean's 10th attorney since the hearing began. The adjournment came after McLean again insisted in court that he does not want to be represented by attorney at law Carlton Coleman. He told the court that he wants to retain the services of well-known criminal defense attorney Christopher Townsend. Justice Bertram Morrison, who is presiding over the trial, granted the request. The trial was adjourned to allow McLean to contact Townsend. Justice Morrison, however, pointed out that since 2008, McLean has changed nine attorneys and warned that if Townsend is not available, the trial would continue. In the meantime, Mr. Coleman, who has been representing the accused since 2016, renewed his application to withdraw from the trial, but Justice Morrison refused to grant his request. McLean is on trial for killing six people, including four children, in St. Thomas on February 2006. The Jamaica Bauxite Institute has set out to improve the livelihood and living standards of farmers and farm families in the bauxite mining areas. Michael Sharp picks up that story. As we well know that a bauxite is not a renewable resource. So what happens after it has been mined? What happens to the land? Well, we are hearing some important initiatives that have been taken by the Jamaica Bauxite Institute. We, we had this program in collaboration with JCIF, the BCDP, the Bauxite Companies, RADA, JAS, and SDC to uh, harvest rainwater so that the farmers can use this water to grow vegetables in greenhouses on the reclaim restored uh, bauxite lands. One other question that will come to mind, especially these bauxite lands that have been mined out and reclaimed, the quality of the soil and the kind of product that comes from them. Is, is there any compromise anywhere? Well, there's contrary to popular belief, there's nothing wrong with the soil. The soil is the, the St. Anne Clay Loam, number 78. It's uh, one of the better fertile soils. The problem is the depth of the soil, the porosity of the soil, and the, the inadequate amount of rainfall that is achieved in these areas. So by uh, harvesting water from the, the greenhouses, 20 greenhouses, uh, contributed by JCIF and other partners, by harvesting the water, the 3,000 square feet of water, per greenhouse, putting them in, in these ponds that were, were created by the bauxite companies and uh, funded by the BCDP, what we have been able to do is uh, through solar system powered uh, pumps, we have been able to recycle this water so the farmers can use it to uh, fertigate their vegetables. and. Most of the, the ponds we created are, are holding up to 4, 000, 4 million gallons of water. So for each site, we have 20 greenhouses. We have a pond with 3 to 4 million gallons of water. We have 20 farmers and we produce uh, sweet pepper, tomato, uh, um, herbs and spices, um, broccoli and cauliflower. And with the consensus that wherever agriculture goes, your economy goes, it is important that we understand that mined out lands can become a real, real opportunity to grow agriculture. At the Gulf View Hotel in Mandeville, Michael Sharp for Frontline News. The major challenge of having an inefficient culture of implementation According to Vice-Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckles, there must be an explanation for this. He was speaking Thursday morning at the launch of a new course at UWE, which is in response to the Regional Leadership Challenge. In place. We have the leadership in place, and yet we are not doing it the way that we would expect in order to have the level of impact. There must therefore be a scientific explanation for this, one that we can understand and one that we can cure. Blaming the victim takes you nowhere. In fact, what it does 
is to illustrate the limitations of your comprehension of the problem itself. So let us then begin by saying that this moment, the development of this program is precisely that, a scientific response to a specific challenge designed to empower and, and to enable the people of the Caribbean. Some of these challenges, he argues, are, syst are systemic, including the ineffective flow of knowledge. Sir Hillary noted that the consequence has been low morale, hopelessness, and an emerging psychology of failure. Now we have to resolve to enter the second 50 years of nation building. And we have identified an area here where we can unblock a challenge and move forward. So the University of the West Indies then has done what it has always done, which is to seek to diagnose and to develop a strategy. And I'm very proud of the work that has been done by my colleagues and by our partners who they have <coughs> mobilized to join with us to make our university continually responsive and relevant. This is, this is a seminal moment, and I'm looking forward very much to seeing the results of this engagement. The new certificate course is deemed transformational leadership to achieve the sustainable development goals. It will be done online over 10 weeks. And concerns are being raised that Attorney General Marlene Malahu Fort is being considered for the position of Chief Justice of Jamaica. Mrs. Malahu Fort has, however, declared that though the opportunity would be a good one under different circumstances, at this time this is not where her interest lies. For several weeks, discussions have been taking place about Mrs. Malahu Fort being one of the candidates for the position following the retirement of Justice Zayla Makala. No, she has addressed those concerns. People believe that this acting appointment is supposed to be holding space for me to assume the role. So let me put this matter to rest. I am serving as a legislator and also in the executive branch as attorney general. I do believe in term limits, but this is where I am. There is no holding of any space for Marlene Malahu Fort to fill. The Attorney General also addressed the matter of whether she was offered the position or not. Who does not aspire to the highest level? Come on, let's cut, let's cut all of the nonsense. That's not where my interest is. But of course, if I were in the judiciary and it came to that and I could discharge the functions and confidence is reposed in me, absolutely. Were you, and offered, I don't think, were you offered the job? No. The issue did not arise. At all? The issue was did never not, discussed with the you. The issue did not arise. The Jamaica Association of Transport Owners and Operators, JATU, has expressed strong disagreement with the proposed road traffic regulations. It is of the view that it will not have much effect in reducing the number of road fatalities. President of JATU, Lewis Barton, expressed his opinion towards the passage of the road traffic bill. The whole thing about the new traffic act is that it seems to be a band-aid. You increase the fine on some violation, but that doesn't stop it. I can point to where some countries have a law, in Jamaica too, where if you commit a crime, you go to prison. But people still commit crime, right? Some of the fundamental things with transportation in, in Jamaica, this new traffic act, glass over it, without really trying to say, well, let us work with all the stakeholders in the sector to stop what is happening. We would like to see real training of drivers in the society. A number of drivers now, we all know it, are buying the license. But because a person can maneuver a car, that doesn't mean that he knows what the traffic laws are or how to behave on the road with other drivers. People who go through the legal process of getting their license are much better drivers than those who buy the license. The most rampant persons on the road now as far as traffic accidents are the bike riders and they are being killed because they are not trained to ride a bike. The road traffic bill was passed in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. The Nurses Association of Jamaica, NAJ, has given the government another deadline to end their long-standing wage negotiations. The NAJ has suggested that the Andrew Holness-led administration come to an agreement with the nurses by March. 
NAJ President Carmen Johnson outlined the schedule. Well, we're hoping, just as the government is hoping, that we can conclude our agreement by the end of February to early March. We do not intend to go beyond March with the wage negotiations because the longer we wait, is the more the time value of money changes. And so we're hoping that we can reach to some agreement and conclude by early March, the very latest. The nurses are also firm in their stance that they will not accept the four-year contract being offered by the government. The NAJ is to formally present its position to the Finance Ministry. Since you spoke with us, we received the offer in writing yesterday. We have since met and we are analyzing the offer. We had our executive meeting today with observers present also. And so basically what we are seeking to do is to respond to the government in writing before the end of this week to let them know our position because as our members have said, they are not willing. They won't be accepting a four-year 16% offer. Another public sector group is now taking action over unpaid fees. Correctional officers at the Metcalf Street Juvenile Detention Center in downtown Kingston are reportedly upset over unpaid traveling allowances and the delay by the Commissioner of Corrections to address the situation. As a result, a correctional officer says the correctional officers at the Juvenile Correctional Facility are conducting only emergency and meal services at the moment. The correctional officers say the failure to pay the allowance has been affecting colleagues who have to take on the responsibility of the additional cost of transportation. And traffic had to be diverted from the Bogwa Gorge allowing and following an incident which resulted in a 45-foot trailer blocking the bridge. Reports are that the driver of the trailer was unable to successfully overtake a vehicle that was stopped by the police. The driver experienced difficulties moving the truck forward or reversing without the possibility of it overturning in the gorge. He stopped the trailer and exited. No one was injured. I feel it. The, the tilt, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go no further. I can't go no further. So I'm going to stop. I'm looking in the mirror and I feel it. I go over and look and I see it. I'm going to stop. Try to go back, try to go forward, I can't move, so I'm just dead and wait for a crane right now, which make a call I heard and dip on we are coming. And Frontline News understands that Mr. Tillerson wasted no time in placing Jamaica in a context of value to the U.S. This stop, I think, is, is important because the, Jamaica is our closest partner in this region. The United States understands the importance of that our security and prosperity are very closely tied to that of our Caribbean neighbors, and we're glad to have the partner we have in Jamaica. And I noted uh, that the Prime Minister is, is assuming the chairmanship of CARICOM, and so I think it made our discussions even that much more timely and useful. While the situation in Venezuela is currently dominating U.S. regional relations, the Secretary underscored commitment to helping Jamaica tackle crime. We appreciate the Jamaica government's commitment to countering narcotics trafficking, and transnational criminal organizations and the cooperation that we already enjoy, but we also see many, many opportunities to enhance that cooperation to be even more effective in disrupting these uh, illegal organizations. We appreciate the government of Jamaica has made important prog progress combating the lotto scams, cooperating closely with U.S. authorities to extradite suspected lotto scammers there has been much speculation whether Jamaica abstained in the United Nations vote on Jerusalem because the government didn't want to risk losing aid from a tough-talking U.S. administration. Secretary Tillerson was asked about the threats of cutting aid. The U.S. sees many, many opportunities for furthering cooperation on trade, for strengthening our security our cooperation, and most particularly for combating these transnational criminal organizations that bring nothing but problems and violence and devastation to Jamaica and the region, but also certainly to the homeland for the United States. Irvin Forbes, CVM Live. The Jamaica Railway Corporation has decided to take legal action against the illegal occupants of the People's Arcade in St. James. Speaking at a meeting with the Mayor of Montego Bay along with public health officials and security forces recently, General Manager of the JRC Fitzroy Williams says they have received several complaints about insanitary conditions and widespread electricity theft at a section in the area. When you 
take when you take everything in in in, in uh, on board and take everything in in um, in mind, it required drastic action, immediate action, um, serious action by the GRC. Williams adds that they have identified the location of the occupants and have served notice for them to vacate the property. The residential occupants in particular have been a major problem for the operations of the, 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 the facility, but also the, based on police reports and other reports, it's a, it's a haven for illegal activity and lawlessness. The Jamaica Railway Corporation will be asking the courts to issue a removal order that is expected to be granted by early March. The trial of the man accused of killing six people in February 2006, Michael McLean, will resume on Monday. This comes after Mr. McLean refused to have further dialogue with his attorney, Carlton Coleman, yesterday. Subsequently, McLean has also requested attorney Christopher Townsend to represent him. Mr. Townsend will inform the court today if he will represent McLean when the trial resumes on Monday. Mr. McLean has been representing himself since, late, since last week after firing his attorney. The NIA and MOCA have reached an agreement that will see millions of dollars in funding for public outreach programs for the major organized crime agency. CVM's Joel Koskill reports. Forces by the NIA to bolster public education campaigns of MOCA was on Thursday agreed to with the signing of an agreement valued at $45 million. And MOCA is of central importance to Jamaica's advancement and to NIA's mission. We included support for MOCA when we made a proposal to the USAID two years ago to uh, uh, come to a cooperative agreement. USAID accepted our proposal and then we invited MOCA to develop a project which we would then review along with MOCA to see its suitability for the needs of the present moment. MOCA worked hard and they developed that project and that project is being now funded by the agreement we're about to sign to the extent of 45 million uh, Jamaican dollars over the next year. The recipient of the valuable donation, Colonel Desmond Edwards, Director General of MOCA, explained how the funds would be used to improve the capabilities of MOCA and expand its outreach programs. The signing today um, represents a significant step in the right direction, we believe as it will assist MOCA to be more effective in its outreach projects. Um, it will also assist us significantly in building our, a public awareness, um, as, and, and it's timely as well as you spoke about the impending passage of our legislation as it goes through, goes to the Senate. Um, we are hopeful that it will um, go through without any issues, and this will uh, the, the, this infusion of resources to do public awareness campaigns and so on, um, I believe is, is timely. Professor Trevor Munro explained the reasoning behind his organization's involvement with MOCA. Over the last many years, NIA has partnered with the Jamaica Constabulary Force. It has partnered with the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. It has partnered with the Office of the Chief Justice in staging, sponsoring, seminars, weekend training seminars, to raise the level of competence. Joel Crosskill, CVM Live. Michael Troop, the People's National Party's councillor for the Granville Division, has been suspended from the St. James Municipal Corporation for three months. The suspension was handed down yesterday following a vote on a motion to sanction the councillor for bringing the council into disrepute. The decision to suspend the long-serving councillor arose from the emergence of documents which show that Troop signed up on payments to his former secretary for work done up to October 31, 2017, more than three months after he said she walked off the job. Opposition spokesperson on justice, Senator Donna Scott Motley, is suggesting it may take the courts to make a final decision on the temporary nature of the appointment of Brian Sykes as the Chief Justice. 
Senator Donna Scott Motley, leader of opposition business and opposition spokesperson on justice, readdressed the issue of the probationary appointment of Acting Chief Justice Brian Sykes during Senate today. At this point in time, I do not even believe that it is necessary for me to speak to the legislation. I believe that eminent jurists, the eminent attorneys have added their voice to the interpretation of the law. There can be no doubt that this action in Jamaica is unprecedented. The strident address by Senator Scott Motley pointed to the precarious nature of justice on the island. It comes at a time when we have 156 people have been murdered since the start of the year. It comes at a time when we have declared a state of emergency, a rose by any other name will smell as sweet. But it comes at a time when no more than ever we need to chart a course so that our public so that our citizens can have confidence. It is, if there was ever a wrong time for this confluence of events, it is now. Scott Motley believes the justice system is being brought into disrepute by Prime Minister Andrew Holness. Who has prevailed on him to be unconventional in these circumstances? Ooh. Ooh. This is not an area in which he must show that he's new and different. The, the, the justice system requires certainty. She suggests that the courts may be needed to resolve this thorny issue. I am convinced now that the only appropriate course that one should take in this matter is to have the courts make a determination and an interpretation of the section. That should put this matter to rest.